This is a Geek Leader Podcast, and I'm your host, John Rauta. This show is all about helping us grow as leaders, become better technologists, and improve our lives both at work and at home. I hope you enjoy the show and learn a lot. Hello, world, and welcome to a Geek Leader Podcast. I'm your host, John Rauta. Today's sponsor is A2 Hosting. I've been using A2 Hosting solid state hosting solutions for our website at geekleader.com for many, many years now and absolutely love their support, their service, and all the features that you get. You get access to cPanel. You get all of the things that you can imagine for a great WordPress experience, including their A2 optimized WordPress, which does extra security checks, extra lockdown. You can lock down your editor uh, file so you can't edit anything inside there. You get alerts whenever there are file changes that are done. Um, You can also do automatic updates, backups, and more with A2 hosting. So highly recommend it. Go to a geekleader.com slash A2 to get more information and to sign up for their solid state turbocharged speed hosting today. Again, that's a geekleader.com slash A2. All right, Geek Leaders, today on the show, I am honored to have Jerome DeRoy with us, and he specializes in storytelling. He's the CEO of Narrative, and we're going to talk about how to be better communicators here in tech today. So with all that being said, Jerome, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks so much. Great to be here. If you don't mind, just tell the audience a little bit about kind of how you got to where you are today at Narrative and what it is that you and Narrative, you know, what what is it you guys do? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I I run a company uh, that specializes in in storytelling and delivering a a storytelling method to people. So there isn't really, uh, to people in business in particular, so there isn't really a, um, you know, a degree for that that I took. So I have a a kind of a circuitous path. uh, So you don't have a bachelor's in storytelling? (laughs) No, no. I mean, who knows? You know, now it's becoming such a buzzword that there might actually be such a thing. (laughs) But but really storytelling for business, when I started out um, and I would tell people, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to help you tell the story of your business in such a way that your clients are gonna be engaged, your employees are gonna be engaged. They would sort of scratch their heads. This was back in 2005, six, seven, uh, scratch their heads and say, with storytelling, wait a second, isn't that, isn't that for kids or for entertainment? Like, well, what's that got to do with business? And of course now, uh, you know, it's it's kind of a buzzword, buzzword in the corporate world. Uh, but when I was coming up, it wasn't. Uh, I went to business school. I actually grew up uh, in Europe. I, I, I was born in France. Um, my dad's French. My mom's American. So, so I, I did all my studies over there and I went to business school there. And then after that, um, I got a job in finance and, uh, and I kind of traveled to different places for five years, uh, including in Hong Kong. And, and after about, uh, yeah, I'd say, yeah, about five years, uh, I was a marketing manager in a very large uh, bank uh, that had subsidiaries all over the world. And at this point in my career, I was in Hong Kong. And um, I walked into my boss's office one day after a Monday morning meeting, which uh, happened every Monday, uh, which had happened every Monday for the last five years, uh, in which my boss would um, uh, go through a PowerPoint presentation and ask questions to me and other members of the team. And he would never turn around from his PowerPoint presentation. So after a few minutes, uh, people's eyes would glaze over and some would even doze off <laughs> and, and take out their uh, really big cell phones at the time, because yeah. this was early 2000. And, uh, and really, you know, they weren't discreet about it at all because he wasn't paying attention at all. And finally, we'd come out of those meetings and, you know, everyone would make a beeline to the, to the coffee machine. Uh, and, and that was sort of the highlight of my day was picking what kind of coffee I would, uh, I would uh, have. And one day, uh, five years later, after one of those meetings, I went into my boss's office with my cup of coffee in hand. And I said, uh, you know, Lawrence, I, I, I quit. And he said, what, what, I don't understand. What are you, what are you gonna do? I mean, I, I thought we were gonna send you back to headquarters and you were gonna climb the corporate ladder. And, uh, and I said, well, no, that's not what I'm gonna do. And, and he said, well, what are you gonna do? And, and he said, oh, before you answer, I think I know. Uh, you're gonna go and work for another bank because they pay better than us. I'm sorry, my hands are tied. There's nothing I can do. I said, no, that's not what I'm going to do. And he said, oh, you're going to go and work for a big consulting firm like McKinsey. I said, because that's what a lot of people do here. And I said, no, no, that's not what I'm going to do either. He said, well, I I give up. I don't know. What are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm not quite sure, but I know it's going to be creative and meaningful. 
And that's how I ended up in New York City. And, uh, and I ended up meeting the uh, founder of this company called Narrative, uh, spelt with one R and no E. Uh, we often say like a, like a five-year-old would, sp would spell it maybe. <laughs> and, um, and he introduced me to this company. At the time, he was uh, also a documentary filmmaker. Uh, and he was a trained psychologist and he had a PhD in social work and he had created this methodology of listening and storytelling. And at the time he was only using it for, you know, foundations, nonprofits, but it was kind of a side gig. And, and he said, well, you've got this business background. Maybe you could, uh, you could help me out in figuring out how to do this, turn this into a business and maybe even help businesses. And that's what I did. Uh, I said, yes, I, I can do that. And a couple of years later, I started running the business and adapting this method to lots of different issues um, that I had seen in the corporate world. Not, you know, one of them being leadership, because I saw how my leader uh, at that particular time was not engaging his audience at all, didn't have a clue of how to do that. And as a result, many people were leaving uh, that department and that company in general. And so I thought we've got something in our hands here where it's a fairly simple method that people can learn and that teaches them to use you know, specific tools. Um, and it's a stepwise process so that anybody can do it, not just the gifted orator or charismatic leader. So that's, that's how I came to do what I do today. I said it was circuitous, so it's a bit of a longer, longer response than your average, uh, here's what I do and here's what my role is. <laughs> yeah. So one of the things I've heard you talk about before is that, you know, and you kind of hit on it there too, is that storytelling is not something that, you know, you have to be born with the ability to do. It's more of yeah. a um, yeah, I think you, you've used the term before in the past. It's more of a science uh, of knowing yes. how to do it. Can, can totally. you explain more about how that? Um... Yeah, what how it works? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah. So, so it is. You know, it's 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 steps basically. And and yes, anybody can do this. Uh, I've I've had that experience. You know, it doesn't matter what your background is, where you're from, uh, how you know, like I said, gifted you are or not. I actually don't really believe in that. I think that those gifted people. That are really charismatic, you know, that we consider as amazing uh, presenters and speakers. They work hard at it, and um, so what we've done is is we've created a methodology, and one of the most important steps that really addresses what gets in people's way um, is is listening, and we always start with listening, and and the the reason we do that is because the way that somebody listens to you is completely informing, influencing, shaping how you're gonna speak. And the more you're aware of that and what influences you and shapes how you speak, the more you'll be able to kind of control what comes out of your mouth and, and really adapt to different audiences. Um, and, and then you realize, once you start to look at that, the second step is sort of looking at how am I listening to myself? Like, what are my judgments about, you know, how I speak, how I talk, how I present or what other people think of me? That's a lot of, this is what we call obstacles, basically. And so we, we first help people look at these obstacles and, and see if they can address them, you know, but, but even just being aware of the fact that, you know, if you're in a room and you're looking at a PowerPoint presentation and you get really distracted by the, the fine print of the PowerPoint presentation, if you become aware of that, for example, or you become distracted by the body language of, of people in the room, these little things that you know, you, you're kind of not conscious of, once you become conscious of them, then you can sort of set them aside and say, okay, that's got nothing to do with me. Uh, or maybe I can actually change that PowerPoint presentation and make it into something that's, that's a little bit more conducive to my creativity. Then you sort of start to, to kind of eliminate these barriers. And then and only then do we start to look at the how. How do you actually tell a story in a really effective way uh, for any audience? And the number one rule we have is to say what happened to you. And this is very, may sound really obvious, but it's distinct from what you thought about what happened what you felt about what happened. So for instance, in the short story that I told you about, uh, you know, how I came to, to be doing what I'm doing, 
I could have told you something like, and I did at one point in my life, I could have told you something like, you know, I really wasn't passionate about my job and banking wasn't the thing that I wanted to do. I, I, I didn't quite know what it was that I wanted to do, but I knew that I needed to do something that was a bit more meaningful for myself. There's no story at all in there because mm -hmm. it's a series of things that are going on in my head that you may or may not relate to. But if I tell you what actually happened, and that's what I did, right? I went into that Monday morning meeting. There was somebody who never turned around to face us, just went through the PowerPoint presentation. People were do dozing off. One day I walked into his office and I said, Lawrence, I quit. And he said, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to do something creative and meaningful. And then I'm in New York City. It's very active. It's action oriented. And there's no uh, indication of what I'm feeling and what I'm thinking other than the description of the actions that are taking place in these scenes. And it's the description of these actions and these scenes that really engage the, the, the wires that are firing in our brain. And this is the science part of it, is that if you look at the human brain, there is nothing that engages the human brain more than a story that is told in that way that I've just described because it, it, and they've done, and I'm not just saying this, they've done studies to see what, what engages the brain and what, you know, wires are firing at which time. And they've noticed that when you tell a story with, with specific details, it really uh, stimulates the brain like nothing else, especially if you compare that to kind of blanket statements of feeling and thought that are, that don't have any specificity to them. There's no action to them. So my brain isn't capable of actually following that as much as it is capable of following a series of things that happened. So that's mm -hmm. what we keep hammering on, uh, hammering to, to our clients is like, just say what happened, what happened next, what happened next, because let your audience figure out the feelings and thoughts even better. Let them feel the feeling. <laughs> that you felt because when they start feeling something and they start thinking something, that's when you're now in dialogue and you're winning because now they're thinking about their own stories and they want to share something with you. But if you already spoon feed them everything they need to know about what you were feeling, what you were thinking, then it's not so interesting. You know, half of the right. room is going to agree with you. The other half, one third is going to be indifferent and the other third is just going to disagree. Yeah, it's, it's, I, I like I like what you're saying there because it seems like if you don't tell them all the things and they have to engage, they actually have to put in some effort to to understand, you know, either yes. your perspective or create their own perspective and their own um, feelings that would come if they were in that situation. Yes, let the listener. We we want to make an effort. You know, it's like when you when you watch an incredible movie or a series or, or you're reading a great book. You know, you're you're into the story, and what you're into is like what the characters are going through in the actual physical world, who they're meeting, what their relationships are, what their obstacles are, how are they going to you know get the thing that they're looking for, the quest mm -hmm. they're on. Why not apply this? in any aspect of your life that you're telling a story about, because that is, I mean, there's no, you know, there's no real secret to it. That's why those blockbusters exist. And, you know, that's why they work so well is they are following a particular formula. And so that's kind of what we, what we've come up with is, is analyzing all of that and then delivering that to people in a way that feels doable to them. Cause that's the other thing is that, and that's where the listening part is really important because getting over these, obstacles that you have about your ability to tell a story or to present anything or to speak in public, for example, there's a lot of barriers and obstacles. And, and we could probably talk all day just about that, you know? Well, um, yeah. So, so one question I have is why do we have yeah. that? Why, why don't we, why, why, why is it when I go and talk to somebody, I have the need, I feel like I have the need to tell them, yeah. you know, maybe some of the details that I shouldn't be telling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I mean, it's, it's, there, there is a psychological aspect to it. I mean, there's a lot of, so what we've done is, is we've actually looked at what these obstacles are. We've kind of categorized them and we found that there's like these five categories of mm -hmm. obstacles to listening. What you're describing stems from um, your listening to somebody else or to yourself. 
And so we thought, well, let's look at what those obstacles are and, and see if we can categorize them, then maybe it's easier for people to actually address them. So what you're talking about is a bit more in my book, it's a bit more of a, of a psychological obstacle, right? Like I, I have to fill in the blanks for my audience essentially. And then we get a little bit um, we get a little bit confused or we conflate things and we think that because we're not getting a response from somebody or we're kind of afraid of the void between us, that yeah. moment of silence, that uncomfortable silence, that we have to fill that as quickly as possible and with as many things as possible. So I would put that in the sort of psychological category, which really, again, doesn't have that much to do with the person you're talking about, talking to, but it has more to do with your own sort of insecurity about, right. about yes. that void, about that silence, right? Yep, 100%. And, and where it's helpful to have a method on how to tell a good story, is that that actually kind of addresses that, that uh, obstacle. Because the moment that you think to yourself, okay, I'm gonna tell a story that has a beginning, a middle and an end. And the most important part of the structure, so you, you know, you're thinking about the what happened sequence mm -hmm. of events like I described, but there's another step in our method that follows that one, which is about the story arc and really knowing your end. And so if you know where you're supposed to end what you're saying, then you're going to show a different kind of confidence because we can we can sort of perceive that um, even if it's not quite you know I can't quite put my finger on it, but if I look at a speaker and you know I might talk to a friend afterwards about it and say you know I don't know what it, what it was about that speaker but there was something that didn't quite can't put my finger on it but but it didn't quite register with me and a lot of times it's because that person didn't quite hit their ending mm. or they got to the end and then the audience thinks it's it's the end but then they filled in more right and again wow. we're talking about that discomfort but it also comes from not having a very clear structure for what you're saying and to me the clearest uh, stories are the ones that have a very definitive end where the person knows that that is my end and i'm going to get to that end even if i started out with a 20 minute story in my mind and someone says, sorry, you only have five minutes. Because I know my end, I can get there. I can get there. And because of what we established earlier, that the brain is capable of filling in the blanks and connecting the dots, and it doesn't need as much information as we think it does, then let your audience fill in those blanks as well. You know, so, so that's what I always tell people is like, know your end and then know your beginning. If you got those two things, your first and last lines, you're really in good in good hands, and then all you need in the middle, in the you know, in between the end, between that first and last line, is really a few markers, you know. And so, let's say that you want to tell a three minute story, four minute story, five minute story doesn't matter, but you know how long it's supposed to be. Then you know you can figure out, okay, well, for a five minute story, I need to end over here. All right, so if I end over here, let's rewind and see where a good beginning would be to serve that end. And then let me have a couple of different milestones that I know I want to hit, hit in those five minutes and leave it at that. Don't script it entirely from beginning to end because that's going to trip you up as well. Because yeah. then what happens is that you start to learn things off by heart and you're not connecting with your audience. You're just preoccupied with remembering your script. And that does, comes off as kind of robotic and you know it doesn't really mm -hmm. work. But if you become more and more comfortable with that story that you've got, and you've got these milestones that you know you need to hit, then you're leaving you some room to connect with the person that you're talking to and see how they're responding. Maybe they want to, you know, butt in at some point and, and bring in their own story. I, I think, you know, the, the best uh, storytellers and, and leaders really in general, I think, are able to notice when the person they're speaking to really wants to speak or is engaged in such a way that they have something to say, then it's time for you to say, okay, you know what? I wonder if you've got something to say or if you've got something to reflect on and then let them speak. Because again, what we're looking for in this particular kind of storytelling that I'm talking about, we're looking for connection. And you know there's connection when there's a dialogue that starts. Right. And so maybe now, you didn't get to the end of your story, but that's okay. As long as your audience is engaged and they're talking to you, then that's great. Now it's your time to listen and to respond to what they're saying. Right. It's part of that engagement part. So once you've gotten to that, if that's your goal, you know, to, to yes. engage, which at work 
typically that's what we're trying to get. And we get that point. We shouldn't just keep going. It's like, no, 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 hold the questions to the end. It's like one of the worst things I think people can do. (laughs) I know we've got the engagement. We've already won. Let's not like ruin it. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And you know, you're also missing an opportunity when you do that by saying, you know, nobody interrupt me uh, until the end. And look, you know, I don't want to say that that it's uh, I don't want to generalize too much and say that, you know, you should never um, say to people, you know, hold questions to the end or, or give me my full 10 minutes, because maybe sometimes that's what's needed. Um, but I think that, you know, in in the majority of cases, you want to let that audience in and and you're you may be missing an opportunity if you don't do that to gather new information from that audience. I see this all the time in sales in particular, where someone just plows in you know, with their, with their agenda, uh, their sales agenda, and it's, they go right into the features of their product and they go on and on and on. And meanwhile, the audience's uh, kind of goals have changed. The buyer's goals have changed between the time they set up the meeting and the meeting. And so, and the meeting taking place. So, so you've missed that opportunity to hear these about these new goals. And it's only at the end of the presentation that you kind of hear about them. And then you're like, oh, we just wasted 30 minutes going through this whole thing when actually I could have told you about this new feature, which is really the one that's relevant to what you're talking about now. So I think, and again, that's coming back to listening, right? So every, you know, no matter how great your story is, I think if you come in with the mindset of always being a listener, and always being curious about your audience, that's going to change. That's a bit of a paradigm shift because what you're doing now is you're trying to put yourself a bit more in the shoes of the person you're talking to and and you're trying to understand and connect with them more than you are trying to uh, rattle off a script or a series of talking points that you absolutely think that you have to hit. Uh, because it's become like urgent or, you know, the, the, the most critical thing in your life. And that's kind of what trips us up again is like, there's so many things that I want to say, I've got to say them all in this one shot. Uh, but actually, no, it's, it's being able to let go of that and say, my goal here is to connect with this audience and to listen to them. Even if I'm doing a keynote speech for a thousand people, I'm still trying to listen to what these people are giving me right now. So how important is like um, adding things like humor and elements like mm. that into a story? Yeah, you know, it, it all depends on personalities. Um, I, I refrain from having a hard and fast rule about things like humor, for example, mm-hmm. because for some people, I mean, not to say that they're not funny, but- Oh, you there's know, some people for, that aren't funny. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you can say exactly. it. <laughs> or, you know, it doesn't really come naturally. It's not really part of who they are to sort of crack a joke, you know? And, and so I, I, I first really encourage people to do something that's authentic to you. And it could be, you know, there's a, the, the origin story of my company that precedes me, you know, comes from the founders. And, and, you know, one of them tells this, this really heart-wrenching story about working with people with AIDS and they were dying. And the only thing they could leave behind were their stories. And that's where this all originated essentially. So he ended up facilitating, uh, you know, people telling stories to their two or three-year-olds that wouldn't remember them. And the only thing that they would remember them by were their stories. So it's not exactly, you know, a joyful, <laughs> a, a, a lighthearted story. And yet there are moments of humor and joy in that story. And so I think rather than saying, you know, I'm not going to approach a particular subject because it's so dark and so tragic that I think I'm going to put people off, but actually, but if it relates to your topic and it relates to your audience and it's and you really feel it's relevant and there's an emotional connection for you and you think there will be one for your audience, don't stop yourself because of the, a general feeling that it's not a feel-good story. Because within that story, I can guarantee that every story has a moment that's funny, that's joyful, and, and that's entertaining. And so, uh, but but we often stop ourselves because we think, oh, broadly speaking, this isn't really a funny story. I shouldn't tell it. I, I don't think that's a good enough reason. I think you, you should still unpack it. The, the best reason to tell a story is the one that kind of engages you emotionally and where you think there's relevance to this audience and to your topic. That's kind of what we look at first. And then we try to put in those 
those to identify those moments that are more lighthearted. Because I, I think, you know, to answer your question directly, I do think humor is important. And I do think that looking at our lives and the stories of our lives in a bit more of a lighthearted way does us all good, you know, uh, to, to try not to take ourselves so seriously. And I think that really communicates to an audience. Um, you know, they, they really, it really engages people when they see somebody letting their guard down or being a bit self-deprecating. Yeah. So uh, a lot of times when you look back at, you know, tech leaders and, and well, p- people in general in tech, sometimes we're historically known as not being the, the you know, best communicator sometimes. <laughs> um, I mean, you can just watch Mark Zuckerberg at the Congress you know, right. <laughs> sessions to kind of, kind of know that. Um, and what kind of value, because it's, you know, when I hear this coming from my, um, before I, I really got involved in speaking and talking um, more and more, uh, it was really challenging for me to try to tell a good mm-hmm. story. And it sounds like a lot of work. So what is the advantages and benefits for doing this in a business standing, setting versus just coming out with the facts? Yeah, I mean, you know, well, there's kind of two things here. A, a good story really packs in a lot of facts and it packs in a lot of action and, you know, data essentially. Uh, it's just that it's wrapped into this um, structure of a story with a beginning, a middle, and end that the brain naturally responds to. And so I think, you know, first of all, kind of separating out um, this, this idea that when I'm telling a story, I'm not talking about facts. Actually, you are, you know, and there's a way to do that. And and the best stories are very, very factual, you know, and they're true to the experience of the person that's telling that story. And, and I would be able to respond to it because I can see how it happened, where it happened, when it happened, who it happened to. And there's not a lot of description of why something is happening in terms of, you know, where did I come from with this? What were my ideas? It's not a brainstorming session, right? And so, so that's the number one. Number two, in terms of you know, the benefits and advantages of, of telling a story uh, that's not just about data, for example, but, you know, I, I think what it does is that it levels the playing field. And coming back to my original point of anybody can do this and can learn how to do this, the advantage of learning how to do it is that you are kind of differentiating yourself in a sea of people who are just giving you statistics and data. And what you're doing with a story when you create a story, yes, it takes work. And what it forces you to do, that work pays off because it forces you to take what the essential data points and statistics are in what you're trying to communicate. And that's those essential points. That's what your audience wants to hear. They don't want to hear the 10 different ways you have of doing one thing. What's the best way of doing it? How did you find out about it? And how is it going to benefit me? right? And so that's where we want to go. We don't want all the explanations of, you know, why something isn't working. We just want it to work. And so I think with a story, it's the same thing. You know, it, it, it forces you to go straight to the really important points and it puts it into a perspective that's all about people. So what I often tell people is like, okay, well, if you're having some trouble with all this data that you have to communicate about, what's going to be the impact of whatever you're working on on real people, you know, real people that are browsing their website. I remember working with a a big tech company that's in the news a lot because there's a certain wealthy individual who's, who's been, well, actually I think he's, but he's bought it now. (laughs) So (laughs) so that, that's, uh, that's the company we worked with once. And, uh, and I remember, you know, we worked with a group of engineers of product managers and designers and all together, and each one has their different agendas and different ways of communicating. And when we introduced this method of storytelling, it gave everybody a kind of a common language. And so that, that's what I mean by leveling the playing field. And then it also gave people the tools to really get to their point, essentially. And so that it wasn't just for the audience, but it was also for the product manager to understand where the engineer was coming from and for the engineer to understand where the designer was coming from and, and you know, all these different kinds of interactions. And so, but the moment you ask them to, to, to think about the impact of what they're doing on real users and what that user experience is going to be, then everything starts to fall into place. Because if that's my end, 
then I know which data to focus on, you know? Uh, so the more you have people in mind, the more you have users in mind, uh, the better your stories are going to be and the more benefits and advantages you're going to find in actually telling stories. Because now you're just telling a story about a user journey, basically. Right. So I'm trying to think about like when I'm in, a, I want to take this to like a, a kind of a granular level for, you know, um, more of an engineer than, than maybe a product owner or something like that. Mm. If I'm in a meeting and I need to sell my boss on an idea. On, sure. We want to use this new framework that's out there that I've been playing around with at home on the side. And I can go in there and just say, here's the facts, you know, here, here's why I like this thing. Um, how should I actually craft a story around that? Should it be more of personal experiences? Should I talk about, you know, my experience with it? Or should I just, just say, uh, or take it through an analogy type type phase or metaphor? Yeah. You know, I, I think, Going again from step number one, who's my listener and who's yep. listening and what what's in it for them, mm -hmm. um, you know, you start to gauge what's the best way to communicate. But there's also a really important point um, that you started to make here, I think, is what works for you? You know, are you comfortable with using your own experience to demonstrate a point? Maybe you're more comfortable using a kind of avatar or, you know, uh, um, uh, a character to, yeah. to that, that you've made up perhaps, you know, I have nothing against uh, fictional characters uh, or maybe it's a, it's a friend or a family member, you know, that has had an experience that's relevant. I think that's the first thing to find is like, what's my topic? What am I trying to communicate? What's this thing that I'm trying to sell my boss on and what kinds of experiences do I have in my life, either my own or other people's people that I know that I can then turn into a story. And if I don't have anything there, if there's no experience that relates to this, then let's see if I can create some kind of character, um, you know, that would represent what I'm trying to say here. So, you know, here's John, he's 32 years old and he works here. And, you know, this is how his day on Monday started, you know, and you just tell the story um, to sort of see that the, the point here, what you're really doing is you're talking about people. And, and that's my big thing is really try to get it to that granular level of what is a person going through? This idea that you're trying to sell your boss on, what's it gonna do to the people that ultimately will be impacted by this idea? You know? Yeah, yeah um, I, I love that. Let me, let me uh, just, I wanna give an example of something that yeah. I did a, a while back and you tell me sure. how I could have done better on this. Sure, or maybe, sure. Or maybe if it was fine. Um, I uh, was a new manager. This is probably a decade or more than that ago. And uh, I managed a team of web and mobile developers. And we had a mobile app that our technicians in the field used to kind of like fix problems and close tickets and things like that that were issued to them. And mm -hmm. I had just finished reading um, uh, two books. One was Dan Pink's um, um, uh, Drive and the other one was Simon Sinek, Start With Why. And I wanted to like apply something about that. And I knew about motivation, you know, how to motivate people in different ways. And uh, so I wanted to put purpose behind it and have purpose into what we were working on. You know, because, you know, that's one of the things in drive is, you know, purpose is important. Yeah. And uh, we had a request come in and it was just like to, to add another way to close a ticket. And it just it, on the surface, it seemed kind of like, oh, they just want to put a button somewhere, you know, and like. a. <laughs> so I went through and I thought, well, I want to I want to add purpose to this. So it's more meaningful for my team to give them some motivation that they're making an impact. So I told a story of uh, I, I said, imagine an employee that that he's you know, working all day long, closing tickets, driving around. And at the end of the day, he has to go back through like 10 tickets, click on them, scroll all the way to the bottom, review the notes, hit next, and then hit close, you know, to close the tickets. And, you know, at the end of the day, he's ready to go home and he's got 10 or 12 of those to do. It's going to take him an extra five or six minutes to go through and do that. But if we just put the button at the top, it didn't have to close anything. Then he can get through them in like a minute and get home to his children faster and be able to play soccer with them or, or spend more time with the spouse, something like that. And, and I kind of gave that example. And uh, the result of that was more than what I expected. I thought, okay, cool. We'll just add this button there. They came up with an idea to do something that I didn't even think about. The person that made the request didn't even think about was a bulk close let's just do one button that closes all 12 of them and get them home even faster. Mm -hmm. um, it, is that kind of an example of what you're going at? I, I love it. That's what I would call a home run. Uh, yeah, it's definitely, yes, because you've done, if I could 
deconstruct that a little bit because um, it's a great example. You know what you're where you're doing at the outset is you're asking people to imagine something, which yes. is pretty effective mm -hmm. uh, because now you've got their their kind of creative part of their brain going on. And and what you then did is that, and this is why it's a story uh, in terms of the structure, is that you started with what was painful to a real human being in the process that currently exists, which is that there's these 10 buttons, you got to do this, and, uh, you know, and, and you're, you're wasting time, you, you need to spend more time on this thing. So you're, you're but, I, but it's not just anyone, it's like this one person that's going through it that has a family, they're late for the soccer game, all that stuff is really important. And we tend to go over that too quickly, in my opinion, uh, too often, because it's, it's, there is that moment where you start to relate to people. You're relating to people in the pain moments, in the painful moments, the struggle. We respond to stories uh, because there's always conflict, there's always suffering, there's always struggle at some point in the story, usually towards the beginning, where our the protagonist, the one we love, is going through something that's hard. And we want to see how that person is going to survive that and, and how they're even gonna thrive after that because our brain is connected to story in a really unique way and understands story structure naturally. And so that's what you did with that story. You started with that pain point and then you showed a solution. You showed not just a solution, which is a, a button, right? But then you showed the impact of that. And you said, you know, they're now going to have time for their family and all these different things. So I, I think it's a, it's a, it's a great, and, and what a great result as well at the end, because you've stimulated people and their imagination and their creativity so much so that they came up with something that you hadn't even thought of, but that's good for the whole enterprise, right? Right. And that's really, that's why I said home run, because the purpose of a story is not to tell the story you know, stand up comic style and drop the mic and leave the room. No, it's actually stay in the room and hear what people have to say in response to the story, because that's usually when the best ideas come out. If your story has been effective, it's going to stimulate people's creativity and ideas. And you want to make sure that you're in the room to hear those ideas, as opposed to like dashing off to your next meeting uh, and, and not quite knowing how that landed. So, so yeah, I think it's, it's great. You've hit on all the, all the structural points of a story. And by the way, that, that what happened methodology that I was talking about earlier of, you know, yeah. stick to the facts of the story. That's true here too, right? It's very specific. There are 10 buttons, there's mm -hmm. one button, there's 12 things it can do. There's an individual that has a family, a soccer game. These are very specific. I can, I can picture all of that and I can relate to all of it, even if I don't have a family and I don't have anybody in my family who, who plays soccer because it's bringing me back to my own experience of childhood and what was going on in my childhood and my parents, you know, whatever. And so that's kind of what you're opening up to. You're, you're, you, when you tell a story, even if it's super specific to your experience, it's always universal because we've all been kids. We've all, you know, done things uh, in sports or whatever, you know, whether we liked it or not, doesn't matter, but we've all, we all have some kind of experience like that. And we certainly had the experience of wasting time on something that doesn't have to be that way. And that's kind of painful to us, you yeah. know? So, so that's the points you, you hit on there. Yeah. I didn't even know it. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, and, and I guess that's the point too, is, you know, you, but you did start somewhere, you know, it's interesting because, you know, one might hear this example and your listeners might think, well, clearly you're a natural John, you know, <laughs> this is what you, 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 you came up with that. But I think you, I mean, you preface this by saying that you read those two books, Drive and Start With Why. By the way, Start With Why is like my uh, Bible. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I really believe in that. And and uh, Dan Pink, uh, A Whole New Mind is also a great, great book. There's a whole thing around storytelling in that book. Um, but yes, you know, but that's what you did. You did that for inspiration. So it's not like you came up with that story super, uh, you know, it's just an innate thing. You, you thought about it, you put some work into it, you thought about it, and you thought about your audience and what you wanted them to, to feel or think as a result of your presentation. Because otherwise, you would have just said the technical thing, 
You know, if right. you hadn't read those books, if you hadn't thought about it that way, if you hadn't prepared for it, you had an intention of engaging your audience in a different way. Your theme was purpose. That's what you wanted to do. You wanted to engage them with purpose. And, you know, that came through with the story. So I think most people that find this difficult, they don't put in the time to actually think about why do I need to tell a story? Why now? And that's, you know, always what we ask is like, why? Yeah. Why do you think you need a story? And what's creating an, a certain urgency for that story? Because the answer is not always yes. You know, the answer is not always yes, I do need a story. Sometimes it's no, I, I, I don't, you know, uh, or, or if you don't have a good enough why or a good enough purpose for it, uh, then you'd better find one because it's going to fall flat otherwise. Right. Uh, Jerome, this has been great. How can people um, connect with you online and maybe find out more about what uh, you and Narrative offer? Yeah, so we we uh, post a lot on LinkedIn. So my profile on LinkedIn is a good uh, good way to find resources because uh, we we post uh, blogs. We have our own uh, podcast called uh, Story Talks, uh, which you can find on our website. Our website is narrative.com, N-A-R-A-T-I-V.com. Or you just go to my LinkedIn profile, Jerome DeRoy, D-E-R-O-Y. Uh, that's that's where I'm, I'm usually most a- active and, uh, and we'll share uh, lots of resources there. Um, our website is great. We have a mailing list. We send a, a monthly newsletter uh, with resources and, and practical tips on how to do this yourself. Um, so, I, so I encourage people to, to go there and sign up for our mailing list and uh, listen to our podcast story talks and, and go visit my profile on LinkedIn. Awesome. And I'll link all those up in the show notes at geekleader.com so people can go that way if they want to link over to those uh, resources as well. Uh, Jerome, thanks so much for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. You're so welcome. Really enjoyed this. Thanks. If you enjoyed that episode, please uh, leave a rating and review in Apple Podcasts. I'd greatly appreciate that. And also don't forget to check out merch. We have some t-shirts that uh, I've designed that are on at geekleader.com. Um, You can click on the merchandise uh, section there and check that out. And also don't forget about the books from our guests. So if you like this guest and other guests that have written books, please um, go ahead and check that out at geekleader.com. I would greatly appreciate it, and I'm sure they would too.